turn now to the Word of God. Um, I, yes, you, you mentioned changing times. Uh, I think that was before I prepared the message. <laughs> so maybe it's, it's rather a loose title to, um, uh, to the message this morning. I'm going to concentrate on Mark chapter 1 and the few verses from uh, chapter 14 to 20. How many of you have been to the Viewpoint Cafe in Felixstowe? Not as many as I thought there might have been. Somewhere on my phone at the moment, um, there's a voucher, uh, a two for one. Some of you are nodding, you've got one as well. That's what all meet up there and sort of um, cause them to have a poor day money wise. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure that's not the point. Well, it has an expiry date on it, so I guess it won't be too long before uh, Debbie and I will, will go there. Um, I, I think it, sometime in the last couple of years when we went there, um, sort of COVID allowing, uh, we were on a diet and uh, we asked for egg and uh, ham and salad. Uh, and the look on their faces was, uh, was remarkable really. They don't think it ever had anyone to order that and weren't quite sure what to do with it. <laughs> but uh, there it is. If you go a little further on from there, well, back towards Felixstowe on the beach, uh, there is a, a lovely part of the beach that uh, uh, will forever be in my mind. It's, uh, it's halfway between where the, the sort of amusement arcade is and the pier. And it was on that beach on Remembrance Sunday in 1960, late in the afternoon, that I became a Christian. I gave my life to the Lord on Felixstowe Beach. So next time you're going past there, um, you might just remember or you might not. <laughs> so there were some dramatic happenings on that remembrance Sunday afternoon. God changed my life. And this morning we're going to look at some dramatic happenings beside the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we're going to explore these verses together and uh, well, let's hope it's a bit warmer as well than it was on that remembrance Sunday afternoon. So, uh, Mark chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 14. This is what verse 14 says. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Here we find John has been handed over. It's uh, an interesting word, this handing over, because it's the same word that's going to be used of Jesus later on in the Gospel, this handing over. John's arrest was something that seemed to trigger the start of Jesus' public ministry. For John, the pointing to Jesus' days were over. Jesus was arriving. What was promised is now becoming reality. Dawn is leading to the new day. And as John was handed over to Herod, so Jesus came into Galilee. Jesus launches his mission on home territory. He doesn't go abroad, he starts where he is. Now, an interesting thing I found when looking at this was that you remember that people came to John, didn't they? Uh, earlier on in the Gospel, he, he describes John's ministry as one in which people came from all over Judea, all out of Jerusalem. They flocked to listen to John and his message of preparation, which included repentance and baptism. But here, Jesus goes to people. That's an interesting thing. People flocked to John, but Jesus went to people. Now bear that in mind, because I think that's an important aspect of discipleship, as we shall discover shortly. He preached the good news of God, or God's good news. What is this good news? Well, Mark entitles his gospel, The Good News of Jesus. Good news of God is Jesus. Not only did he announce it and speak about it, he was and is the good news. The message and the messenger are one. And that's another important aspect of discipleship to bear in mind. Verse 15, the time has come. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the gospel. 
These are the words of Jesus. The time has come. Speaks about the uniqueness of this moment. The opportunity is now. Now is the time, says Jesus. At home, uh, we have a, a log cabin. And in the log cabin, it's, it's full. It, you have a job to get in it. Um, but one of the things in, in the log cabin is my uh, late father's leather reclining chair and stool. There's just about room to sit on that. Now, I, I remember him buying that. Um, he lived in Clare, and he bought it from Glasswells in Bury St Edmunds. And the, the buying of that went on for months. It really did. Every time you, you visited him, or every time you spoke to him on the phone, he said, guess where I've been? I've been into Glasswells to see this chair. I think what he was doing was waiting for a sale to come along to reduce the price or something like that. But it went on and on and on, visiting, cogitating. Eventually, he bought the thing. But with Jesus, there is no going on and on and on. Jesus is saying that this moment is not something that would go on and on. It is now and needs to be acted upon in the now. The next statement is about the kingdom of God. What does Jesus say? The kingdom of God has come near. It is so close. The moment has arrived. Now is the time to do something. What is so close? The kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is where God is. It's where God is recognized. It's where God is accepted. It's almost as if Jesus were saying, look, what John told you has now happened. What he got you ready for is so very, very close. The kingdom of God was there in the presence of Jesus and he was certainly close to them as he went to meet with them. Have you been on any of the new trains? Um, they're, they're fantastic if you haven't been on them. Uh, they're so much quieter and smoother. And you might have heard that there's an awful lot of talking goes on in the, about, in the trains about where you are and uh, what the next station is, and if you see something, for goodness sake, report it. Uh, but these, these trains are brilliant, uh, and there's nothing more exciting, well, there is lots of things more exciting, but there's something rather exciting about sort of, you know, standing on the platform, waiting for the train, and the train comes into the platform, and, but it hasn't quite stopped. And you just wait for that moment for it to stop. And that, I think, is the, the meaning behind what Jesus is saying here about the kingdom of God. It's here, but it hasn't quite stopped. But now you need to get ready to get on the train. Because once the doors open and you get on, in the light of now is the time and the kingdom is at hand, says Jesus. And two imperatives come from that. And these things, you know, form the basis of discipleship. Something new is happening and it requires a response. Recalling, if you like, the, uh, the message of the Old Testament prophets for the people to return to their true relationship with God and to be faithful to him. Jesus says, repent. Repent. To think differently. It's a change that is more than a word thing. The inner person, the whole of a person is involved. It's a change of direction of the whole of your life. It's a radical new direction. This is, Jesus was not talking about a patch up. He wasn't talking about a course correction. This is new. It's a realization that we've been going in the wrong direction and it's time to turn around and to turn around the whole of your life. It's a turning away from. That's repentance. And believing in the gospel, he says. If repentance is a turning away from, believing is a turning to. And believing here uh, is a trusting. 
You must have seen this, uh, and I guess um, Ian, you might even have tried it in the past. You get people to learn to trust you. You get a child, and you get them to stand there uh, facing away from you, and you say, now fall into my arms. And uh, sometimes they do it, sometimes they don't. Uh, I've only done it once, and I vowed then I would never do it again. I had this young boy who was very glad to come and give me a hand to do this, uh, do this thing. And uh, I, I, I turned to him and uh, I said, okay, now fall into my arms. Do you trust me? Fall into my arms. And he did. I got hold of his shirt, but his shirt was so loose that it came off. <laughs> and unceremoniously, he got up on the floor. I declared then I would never do that ever again. Jesus is saying is, trust me, believe in me. The response of acceptance and commitment. And the commitment to Jesus is not spelled out here, is it? We need to read the remainder of the gospel to look for the answer. Again, this is a relationship matter. Our confidence, our commitment is not in words. It's not what you find on a page in a book. But it's in Jesus. Our commitment, your commitment, my commitment, is to the Jesus who is the good news. We'll carry on, but we'll not bring the actions into this one either. As Jesus, in verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Jesus was wandering by the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was a, a place for fishing. There was a prosperous fishing industry there. All around the lake there were fishing people and uh, they would uh, not only just sell locally but it would go further afield. But this, as far as Jesus was concerned, was not an idle stroll. There was a purpose. Outwardly, it might have seemed like an ideal day. It was an ideal day. It seemed calm. But we know what is coming. So without spoiling the plot, we can say that the kingdom of God doesn't come with a fanfare. It comes with Jesus approaching individuals. The Jesus, it was time to start gathering around him a group of followers. We call them disciples. They're not perfect. They were flawed, they were vulnerable, but the kingdom of God is being established. Let's see the call of the first four. Simon and Andrew, they were fishing. Naturally they were fishing, they were fishermen. What else do fishermen do? And the word here denotes that sort of round net, if you like, that is uh, either thrown into the water from the, the back of a boat or the fishermen would wade into the water and cast it. They would, you did it before, didn't you? They would cast it and it would sink to the bottom. And obviously it would catch all the fish <coughs> that were underneath it. Easy. No problem at all. Do you fish? Are there any fishermen here? Well, I went fishing once. Only once. <laughs> um, I hadn't got a license. Oh, I shouldn't tell you that, shall I? I hadn't got a license. I found out a quiet stretch of... I'd been fishing with my cousin, and I thought, this sounds exciting. So I went on my own, and uh, I found this quiet stretch of uh, water. And, uh, as I put the bait on the hook and put it into the river, uh, I was praying. I was praying that I wouldn't actually catch a fish. <laughs> Because, you know, it, I was just dead scared that this fish would come up and I'd have to do something with it, like <laughs> take it off the hook. Um, well, I have to say that my prayers were answered. <laughs> Verse 17. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out fish for people. Jesus called them. Now, 
It's an interesting point here. That Jesus uses the same word that he used when he called Lazarus out of the grave. And if you look at that story, the, the English translation has smoothed it down quite a lot. But what Jesus actually says when he stood in front of the grave, and they'd taken the gravestone away, and stood there. And Jesus shouts out, Here! Out! That's all he said. And it's a similar kind of thing that Jesus was saying here to, uh, to these two. I don't think he was shouting at them here. This was, no, this was no take it or leave it called by Jesus. It was more of a summons about it that requires acceptance or rejection. Obedience or you turn your back. There's a choice. You either accept or refuse. Follow me. Here, says Jesus. Here beside me. Follow me. And I will make you to fish for people. Here are the two sides of uh, the coin of discipleship. An active, living relationship with Jesus. Come here, follow me. And a total commitment to what Jesus is about. Follow me. I will make you to fish for people. Verse 18. At once they left their nets and followed him. Without hesitation, immediately they turned their backs on their nets and all that that symbolized, and they took their stand with Jesus. Yes, they would follow him. Yes, maybe they didn't understand what they were letting themselves in for, but yes, they would follow Jesus. Yes, they would join him in his mission. When they'd gone a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. The walk along the shore continues. Two brothers, James and John, working with their father Zebedee. There was a, quite a, a good family business going on here. But they weren't fishing. They were mending their nets in readiness for the next time. And immediately Jesus called them. I get the impression that there weren't too many hellos. They were kept to a minimum. But the last words of this passage that we read this morning are those words, they followed him. Let me finish by saying a couple of reflections and a by the way. <coughs> the first reflection is this. What a huge privilege it is to follow Jesus. What a huge privilege it is. How, how wonderful that Jesus came to show us how wonderful is God's love for us. And if you don't remember anything else about this morning, you probably remember the yuck. Forget that. That's just yuck. All right. But just remember how wonderful God's love is for you. Jesus came to us and he found us. How does the song go? You did not wait for me. I would say to you this morning, rejoice. Rejoice in your Felixstone Beach moment, whatever that happened to be for you. What a privilege it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What a privilege it is to be someone who is so close to Jesus. To the Jesus who is the Son of God who came into this world, who went to the cross that we might be forgiven and have new life. Close to the Jesus who was raised from dead on the third day, who has ascended into heaven, close to the one who one day will come again and who is with us this morning by his Spirit. What a privilege to be in his presence. What a privilege to watch, to listen. What a privilege it is to receive love 
and to respond in love. What a privilege it is to be part of Jesus' mission. If you're wondering where the 1 Corinthians 13 reading comes into it, it's here, it's short. As I listened to that being read this morning, that is a fantastic reading, isn't it? And it's one of those passages that I would be reluctant to preach on, really, because uh, I think whatever I said would spoil it. Well, I, that happens with most of them, anyhow, but that, that particular one. To be part of Jesus' mission, what a privilege that is. To be loved and to share love. The love of 1 Corinthians 13. What a privilege. And the second reflection is this, what a huge challenge we have. The challenge that we take our following Jesus seriously. In being close to him as followers and inseparably joined to him in mission. Not our mission, but his mission. The good news mission. Now when you stop and think about it, you know where you are in that, don't you? I know where I am in it. We know where we are. Let's remember what a huge challenge it is to be close to Jesus and to be involved in his mission. And uh, by the way, I've said here, do you need to go back to the beach? Not for the yuck, but for the thumbs up to Jesus. The thumbs up to Jesus in repentance and trust. You will follow him and be part of his mission of love. By the way, do you need to go back to the beach? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, sometimes when we think about you and about the way in which you've come to us, we find it difficult to find words. Because being with you is just so wonderful. Being involved in your mission is such a challenge. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We worship you as the one who came into our world. We worship you as the one who came into our lives and who comes into our lives. We worship you as the Lord of all. We worship you as the one who declares that the kingdom of God is near. We worship you as we join with you in sharing and spreading and living the good news of love, your love. And Father, we pray for any who perhaps do not know you this morning. We ask that they will hear your voice and that they will respond with their spiritual thumbs up. Amen.